welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. You may be seated. It's always a privilege to be in this house. And I'm so excited about the future of what God has for each one of us and the future for this house. And this uh, Freedom for Our Future campaign and just the vision that God has. I believe the best days for The Rock are yet ahead. And the best days for your life are yet ahead. Amen? Amen. And that we as a church will become where everything here is kingdom owned. Belongs to God. Amen? Not a bank, but to God. And that that's just the beginning of what God's going to do to make us an engine for end time revival all around the planet. And, uh, and so, you know, I want to just speak to you tonight. We're, no matter what you came in here, um, maybe, maybe you've been living your whole life for God and you've had a wonderful life and ministry and calling and everything else. Or maybe, like many of us, you know, that you had a rocky past or things happened or things um, have not been fantastic up until now. But I want to bring a message that from where you are now until Jesus takes you home, that's what counts. Amen? And um, this is called finishing well. Finishing well. Because the Bible says it's not how you start. It's how you finish. That is what is on the agenda of heaven. And no matter what, because the scripture we're going to re- read was written by the Apostle Paul who had had a pretty good record up until the time that he wrote this. But he says, it doesn't make a difference. Don't worry about the past. Let's read the opening scripture. We're going to start in the book of Philippians chapter 3. It'll come up on the overhead. And the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in, in Philippi. And he makes an amazing statement because if anybody you would think had arrived, it was Paul. And he says these words in verse 12. Philippians chapter 3, not that I have already attained or am I already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Then he goes on and he says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Everybody say one thing. One thing. He doesn't say 10 things, he doesn't say 50 things. He's not giving you a hundred point sermon. The Apostle Paul says, I do one thing. One thing. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Paul said, I do one thing. I forget those things that are behind. No matter how good or bad or or ugly or whatever they were, Paul says, I do one thing I have to forget. My first point is that in order for you to finish well, you've got to do that one thing. You have to forget what's behind. That's the starting point because the enemy's plan and his strategy for each of us is to try and remind us of the things that are behind. And I just want to give you a few things that he tries to remind you of. He tries to remind you of hurts and bitterness. He tries to dig them up. It's amazing you start worshiping God and praying and trying to have a quiet time with God and suddenly you just start thinking of somebody who did something wrong, a hurt or somebody that mistreated you. Or I mean, it's like the enemy just wants to stir it up. Maybe that's just me. But maybe some of you have had that. He tries to remind you of broken relationships. He loves to try and bring those back to your remembrance. He tries to remind you and get you to dwell on and think about past disappointments. But these are the things that you have to consciously forget. You've got to forget hurts and bitterness. You've got to forget broken relationships. You've got to forget past disappointments. Things that have happened that maybe have left you, you know, maybe not with a strong sense of self-esteem or or, or, or self, you know, um, just a a self-confidence. You've got to forget the betrayal of other people because almost everyone in this room have been through betrayal. 
And so these are things that you have to forget because Paul says, if you want to finish well, there's one thing you have to do. You have to forget the things that are behind. And I can tell you that it's not always easy. You've got to, you've got to forget rejections of the past and of the present. You may be in a situation of rejection where people, you know, have, have, have not appreciated you and you have sensed a, a real sense of rejection, maybe from family or from, from friends or from people around you. And you have to actively put aside rejection because the rejection is one of those things that you have to forget. You have to forget regrets. Maybe if only I would have, could have, should have. Because all of us have regrets about maybe something that we could have done, that we should have done, or, you know, if only I had taken advantage of that opportunity, or if only I had done this or that. And the enemy is so good at stirring these memories up. But there's a conscious decision that you have to say, the one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to forget them. I'm going to push them behind me. I'm going to get them on the other side. We have to forget failures and mistakes. And all the past excuses that we have made, we've got to consciously make a decision to forget. Now, you know, I'm, I'm contexting this whole message with the, the area of forgiveness. You know, I'm not even, all of these things, and, and we, we, we're having, you know, the uh, freedom for our future, and all these begin with the letter F. But forgiveness, I didn't put in there because I'm, Trusting that you as believers, that that is a precondition of everything. Because we as Christians, we have to forgive. I mean, you know, you may not forgive uh, somebody and you may not be praying to God, forgive me as I forgive others. But let me tell you, every person in the world that's praying the Lord's Prayer, and there's about 700 million Catholics that pray it about eight times a day, you know, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, and I start my prayer time with the Lord's Prayer, and I, I consciously, and I pray it specifically, the Bible says, forgive us our sins or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. It doesn't say forgive my trespasses. It says forgive our trespasses. That means that millions are praying that for you. That the only person who can stop the forgiveness of God in your life, the only person is yourself. Nobody else. Because you are praying, forgive us our sins as I forgive others. So if you don't forgive others, you've immediately canceled the forgiveness of God over your life. So we're laying the groundwork that forgiveness is a requisite of everything. Amen? Amen? But on top of forgiveness, now there's a number of people that have wronged me in my past. And I consciously, you know, the enemy tries to visit me daily with those thoughts. And when I come in my prayer time, after I've prayed the Lord's Prayer, I consciously, actually, specifically by name, especially the ones that have been hurtful and really major, Lord, I forgive them. I choose to forgive them today. I choose to put them under the blood. I choose to make that decision. I consciously do it daily so that the enemy cannot get a foothold or any way dig those things up into my life. So it's a good discipline. Some of you, maybe you're able to forget them completely and you have absolutely no memory. Praise God for that. But a lot of us, we need some help in that area. Amen? Amen. So forgetting those things that are, are behind is, is the first area. Um, Lisa and I were just recently in the country of Scotland. About a month ago, we preached in Scotland and near Glasgow. And I just love the Scottish accent and the, the, the pastor of the church, her husband had passed away, was Pastor Greta, Greta. And, and there was a pastor that had graduated some of our students about eight years ago. His name was Pastor Donnie McLean. Donnie McLean. And, you know, he, he had told me, he actually was at the services we were at in Scotland, and he had told me a story that he had heard when he was visiting here in California. So remember, I did not hear the story from Jack Hayford. I heard it from Donnie McLean. So every time I, I think of the story, I think of it with a Scottish accent. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he was sharing about how, how Jack Hayford had shared the story with a bunch of group of pastors. And the context of the story was that 
up until that point, Jack Hayford had never, ever, and those of you who don't know who Jack Hayford is, he's, the, he's the, one of the greatest uh, Christian leaders in the whole body of Christ. He wrote this, the song Majesty. He was head of the entire Foursquare denomination. He is somewhere up there near Billy Graham and those type of people. He is an incredible ambassador for God and a man of integrity. And so when he tells a story, it carries some weight because Jack Hayford, you, he says a sentence and you have to sort of decipher it because it's so complex and it's got so many big words in it and you have to sort of uh, unravel it to understand it. But he's a brilliant man with words and he's highly, highly influential and respected. But he had never until this time of the story had never flown first class. He had always gone economy. And, you know, when you fly economy a lot and, you, and you're there and you look up ahead there and there, you know, these people are having their warm peanuts and their, you know, whatever. You know, they're in these large seats that you can lie down and sleep in and you're crunched between, you know, two, three hundred pound people and, you know, you, you, you just spill everything on your lap and you can't get out. And, I mean... You can look ahead, and he for years had looked at the people in first class and was like, oh, Lord, one day I'm going to be up there. One day I'm going to get a chance to go first class. Well, his chance finally came. And a ministry that was inviting him, we're paying for a first class ticket, Jack. And he was so excited. And so he arrived there, and he got into the first line queue and in the line, and he was, and he was on the plane, you know, one of the first people called. And, and then... He had a steward from hell that had been assigned to him in first class. And everything that he had dreamed about didn't happen. The steward said, put your own coat up, sir. I'm sorry, I'm busy. He, 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 was, um, he was assigned the worst seat in first class, if there is one, but there are some that are not as good as the others. And he was, um, the guy spilled stuff all over him and, and, uh, and you know, he didn't bring him any of his little warm peanuts and, he, and, and, for, and one thing after another, the steward just treated him terribly the whole way through the flight. And Jack Hayford is fuming now and he's like, I, I'm, I'm going to write a letter to the president of the airline. I mean, and he can do that. <laughs> and so he finally, towards the end of the flight, he was just so upset. He took out his, his, his letterhead and he began to compose a letter about how upset in his first experience in first class that he had this, this horrific experience. And he began to write this letter. And as he's about a few lines down, he hears the Holy Spirit speak to him. But I'm hearing this from a Scottish guy. And, and the line that the Holy Spirit was speaking to him was, Let it go, Jack. Let it go, Jack. And he, he writes a few more lines, and the Holy Spirit's now even stronger. Let it go, Jack. Let it go. The flight continued to get worse as he was going along. He took out his paper again. And again, the Holy Spirit. Let it go, Jack. Let it go, Jack. Until the end of the flight, God said, let it go. Now, that story has helped my wife and I so much. Whenever we get upset, whenever the enemy's bringing stuff back at us, whenever we just, you know, have that temptation to take a hold of things from the past, take a hold of, you know, past resentments, bitterness, hurt, whatever, I turn to my wife and I say, let it go, Jack. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Donnie McLean. That we must let it go. We must forget. We must put things behind us. And Paul says, the one thing I do, he's not giving us a, a, a huge sermon. I just do one thing. I have to consciously put things behind me. I've got to let them go. I've got to forget them. I've got to put them behind, them, behind me, and I cannot let the enemy regurgitate and bring them back again. Amen? Amen. Now that's point number one. But point number two, if you want to finish well, there are certain things you must remember. So my second point is forget not. First point is forget. Second point is forget not. It's amazing how the enemy 
brings back the things that you shouldn't remember and then represses the memories you should remember. Isn't that the truth? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. I read it from the Message Bible. It'll come up on the screen so you can just uh, look at it. it. It's crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we've heard so that we don't drift off. If the old message delivered by the angels was valid and nobody got away with anything, do you think we can risk neglecting this latest message, this magnificent salvation? We always have to remember what we carry. Have to remember our salvation. Remember eternity. And remember what Jesus did on the cross. We have to remember what God has already done for us. We have to remember His faithfulness, His goodness. We've got to remember many, many areas of our lives that the enemy tries to repress. Psalm 77, we'll put that up on the screen. That the, the uh, King David wrote this. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. He's in a state of distress. But he says in verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Psalm 103 goes on to say, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all of his benefits. He forgives all of your sins, heals all of your diseases. And the Bible says there are things that we must remember. We have things we must forget, things we must remember. I'm just going to give you a few of them. We must not forget all that God has done for us. We must not forget God's faithfulness, faithfulness to us in the past. Don't forget His promises to you. Now, I don't know if this is a situation with your kids, but particularly with my oldest daughter who's in law school, who's got such a call of God in her life and, and, the, and has had such an, a divine grace and God has orchestrated her steps for since she was born. And every single time we face, it seems like we just face another crisis. And she's like, oh, Dad, how am I going to get a job in the summer? Who's going to hire me? I get, I mean, because she's in, she's in second year of law school and, and she's always facing, you know, how, whether her student loans are going to come through, whether she's going to get an internship, whether she's going to get a position, whether she's going to get into a class. It's like, and every single time, Lisa and I have to take it back. Christina, remember what he did last summer. Remember what he did before. Remember his promises. Remember how he orchestrated your life. We have to keep reminding her of all the things that God has spoken, of all the things he's already done. And you know what? It's supernatural. Every time God comes through. But you know how many tears are in the middle of it all? I'm like, whoa, well, these wasted tears. Because it just seems like when the next thing comes, we've got to go through all the tears again. And I've got to keep reminding her of all that God's done. And then God shows His faithfulness. And now we're back again. Remember God's faithfulness and God's goodness and all that He has done. And He will do it again. The children of Israel, I can't even, I can't even fathom that you know, they, they go to Mount Sinai and the, the, the whole mountain is on fire with smoke and God comes down and I mean, he speaks with a, a voice from heaven and Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and, you know, they see the, and hear the audible voice of God. They've just been through the Red Sea. They've just watched God, you know, uh, uh, bring water from a rock. They've got manna coming every single day from heaven, supernatural food just going on the ground and they go and pick it up. They, they've seen miracle after miracle. They saw all the plagues of Egypt. They've seen everything... Moses disappears for a few days and they're worshiping a golden calf. I mean, now you may say, oh, those children of Israel, but you know what? We Christians sometimes, we're the same. We're the same. After all the things God does for us, and the next crisis comes and we're like, oh God, oh, I'm not how I'm going to pay my rent this month. 
Well, God paid your rent in the last 15 months, so why is this month going to be any different? Amen? We must not forget what it was like before we found Christ. Don't forget what people in the world who don't have Christ, how lonely, how lost, how broken, how hurt they are. If you don't have God in your life, I sometimes wonder how people survive. But sometimes we are so blessed as Christians, we have a hope, we have a future, we have a life, we have, you know, we have the presence of God, Jesus is with us, but we forget what it was like when we didn't have it. We need to remember that. Don't forget the day of your salvation. It's so amazing that you look at the life of the Apostle Paul and, you know, all through his life and he gets before kings and before Felix and before the Roman governors and every single time you see the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, he comes before these famous people and you think, oh, he's going to preach this amazing sermon. What does Paul do? He goes back and tells the story of how he was going to go and persecute Christians. And he's knocked from his horse and he has an encounter with Jesus Christ and he talks about the day of his salvation. The day of your salvation should, you should never forget. It is the most powerful moment of your entire life when your life was transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And your salvation, do never, don't ever forget it. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't forget your dreams. And don't forget your purpose and your calling. Your best days are yet ahead. There's a, there's a goal for your life. From now until, you can't do anything about the past. None of us can change the past. Where you are right now, there's a goal ahead. Whatever has happened in your life can be redeemed. Whatever has happened in your life, God can turn it into something amazing. And every one of us have a calling. And the Bible says that, that we need to remember the calling. Remember His promises. Remember what He's spoken. Remember what He wants for your life. And keep it before you. And we'll go that into, with that into the next point. Don't forget your calling. Point number three is focus. See, the Apostle Paul goes on and he says these words. In Philippians 3.12, in the beginning scripture that we started. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. Where you focus is going to be where you go. Where you look, where you concentrate, where you put your focus is where God wants you to to change. He wants us not to focus on the past, not focus on, you know, mistakes, not focus on failures. He wants us to focus on what He has for our lives in the future. There's a finish line for all of us. There's something that God wants each of us to accomplish on this planet, to do and to fulfill and to be. And we have got to put our eyes on what God has for our future. That's why I'm so excited about this campaign. I can see this church paid for. I can see us reaching the world. I can see us raising up a new generation. I can see what God wants to do in this house. Amen? And it's something that I can put my focus on. I want to be a part of this. In every, every ounce of my being, I want to see the purposes of heaven here in this church. And we can all partake of it. We can all have a share and have a part of it. And it's so important for us to focus where God wants us to focus. Now, this is so much. We've seen more of the works we do around the world destroyed by people taking their focus of what God wants them to do and putting it on something else. I tell my regional leaders around the world, I say, the enemy of God's best is not evil. It's good. I'll say it again. The enemy of God's best is good. Because if the enemy 
knows that, you're, that this is God's best for your life, this is where the massive fruit, this is where the calling of God is, if he can get you to focus on something that's good, but not the best, he's got you. Because you'll do something good, you'll feel good, well, I'm doing something that's nice and I should be, but it's not what God called you to do. And so we need to focus on the best that God has for our future. Don't settle for, you know, something that's, that's, that's minimal when God wants you to have something that's maximum. All right? So we need to focus on the right thing. It's an interesting thing, and I shared this with Pastor Jim last week. When I was with, working with Reinhard Bonke for three and a half years, Lisa and I traveled with Reinhard Bonke, and she was the uh, publications director, and I was the television producer. And I had come out of a, a, a degree at a region university in television and media, and I, I was so excited. I, I'm going to film the famous evangelist Reinhard Bonke. And... I had heard and I'd seen some sort of videos how God opened blind eyes through his ministry. And I was, I was like, you know what? I just want to capture a blind eye getting opened. I mean, to me, that's like the coolest miracle. And, and so I, I joined Reinhardt for my very first crusade, and it's up in the west coast of Ghana, a little town called Sekondi Takarati in the, in the west coast of Ghana, and we travel to this little tiny town, and they, they're meeting on the, on, on the school field. And Reinhardt gets up and preaches the first night. And on about the second or third night, Reinhardt says, Tomorrow we are going to pray for the blind people. And that's what I wanted to hear. And he tells them, I want all of you to bring the blind people, and we're going to put them over here. They're going to have special VIP seating. So, I mean, I am just like, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Next day, I mean, I'm gay. I put my camera right there in front of the blind people. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, and I get this, and I got my camera and, and I'm zooming in. There's about 50 or 60 blind people. And it comes the time of the service and I'm just so excited. I'm like, I'm going to capture a blind miracle. I'm just so excited. And Reinhardt says, cover your eyes. So all these blind people, there's about 50 or 60 of them, covering their eyes. And Reinhard prays for them. And, and I'm zoomed in on their faces, and I'm just, I mean, I got the best shot. I mean, this is going to make me a million. YouTube wasn't big in those days, but you know what? <laughs> this has gone out there. And then Reinhard says, take away your hands. And these blind people take away their hands. And Reinhardt says, how many of you can see me? And he's waving his hand in the front. And suddenly a hand goes up over there and another hand over there. And there were about four or five blind people that came to the, the platform and chased Reinhardt around. And everybody's gone crazy. Everybody's dancing and rejoicing except me. Because my camera's focused on the 45 that didn't get healed. And they take their hands away and they can't see anything. <laughs> and I mean, I'm seriously troubled. It's my first crusade with Reinhard Bonka. Now, I'm pretty bold, all right? So we're staying in the same uh, complex together and we used to travel with Reinhard. And it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. He's taking his afternoon nap but the next day before he's going up to preach. And I couldn't hold it back anymore. So I go up to his desk and I, up to his door and I knock on the door and I say, he comes, hello. I said, Reinhard, I have a question for you. It's bugging me. He said, I filmed the blind people yesterday. I said, what about the 45 people that didn't get healed? I was focused on them. I was, I was just... You know, I, I, I saw the disappointment on their faces. I, I said, what do, you, what do we say about those people? And he said something that changed my life. He said, Baron, he said, you can either look at what God is doing or you can look at what God isn't doing. He said, it's better that we prayed and five people can now see who could never see before than we did not pray and nobody can see. 
Amen. It's where you focus. So many times the enemy has us focus on what God isn't doing rather than on what God is doing. Look at what God is doing. And it changed my focus because I realized we're not responsible for the results. God is responsible for the results. We are responsible to pray. We are responsible to trust God. And we trust Him to do what He does. He is the resulter, the result keeper. Amen? We need to focus on what God wants to do, on where He's going, on what He has done, on His goodness, on His promises, on His blessings, on all that He has done in our lives. And we need to keep our focus on the goal of where He's taking us and never let the enemy distract us, never turn to left or the right. We need to keep going on the path that the Holy Spirit has called each one of us to. Amen? Amen. If we're going to finish well, you better keep your eye on the finish line. Amen? Amen? I'll just give one more example because this is an important one. And where we focus, you know, we have a, a number of DVDs back there. I'll mention a few at the end of the service. But one of them is by Cheryl Salem. Many of you know Cheryl. Um, she was Miss America. Um, she had a, tr a tremendous tragedy of losing a five-year-old to a brain tumor. And when that happened, she was devastated. I mean, she had everybody in the world pray for that child. And that girl, Gabriella, went to be with Jesus. And, you know, after it happened, she got cancer. And they thought, she, and she said, Lord, take me home. I don't want to live anymore. I want to be with my daughter, and I'm, my heart's broken, and I just want to go and be with you. And she was going into the operating room. They were going to try a last-minute uh, uh, effort to save her life of this cancer. They didn't even expect that she would survive the operation. But she was on the gurney going into the operating room when God took her out of her body and she was caught up in the heavenlies and she had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. And she got to ask those tough questions. How many of you got a few questions for Jesus on the other side? Amen. She's like, what? what about my daughter? Why did you take her? What? What? You know, and Jesus gives her one answer that completely changed her life. And Jesus said these words, Gabriella is not in your past. She's in your future. And shifted her attention and her focus from what she lost to seeing her again. And that changed her life. Where you put your focus can determine your destiny. Amen. King David, when he was praying for the child that had been, was born to Bathsheba, the child lived for about seven days. The Bible says David fasted and, and prayed, and, and people were scared to tell David when the child died, David knew that the child died. He got up and he ate a good meal and he, he washed himself and he went and worshipped in the temple. And they said, well, why... The child's dead, you should be mourning. And, the, and David said, no, so the child's not coming back, but I'm going to go to the child. I will see the child again. That child will be with me in heaven. And where you focus is so important because if you focus in the past, the enemy can just pull you into an abyss of, of, of despair and disappointment and, and just, you know, of just deep despair. But if you focus that you will see those people again, then God can do something. Then you are having an excitement and a hope because you have your race to finish. And the Lord said to Cheryl, your, her race is, is over, but yours is still got a lot to go. Pick up the pieces and focus on what God has for you. And now her ministry is touching people all over the world and bringing hope to people who've lost loved ones. Amen? Amen. It's focus in the right place. Amen? I read about a man by the name of W. Mitchell. He's the recognized expert on overcoming life's challenges. He was the former mayor of Crested Butte, Colorado. He is an author and he's a TV host. He's a congressional nominee and a respected conservation leader. He co-founded and chaired Vermont Castings. It's a business. All of this after he had a flaming motorcycle accident that took his fingers, his face, and nearly his life. 
And then four years later, he was piloting an airplane, had a crash and became paralyzed in an emergency crash landing. He speaks now and delivers a message about taking responsibility for change after these two life-threatening and life-changing experiences. He talks to groups about the possibilities of the human mind and spirit. He was awarded the Council of Peers Award for Excellence, the CPAE. It's the pinnacle of recognition in platform speaking. And he once told a patient at Craig Hospital in Denver and repeated this on the Today Show, before I was paralyzed, there were 10,000 things I could do. Now there are 9,000. I can either dwell on the 1,000 I lost or focus on the 9,000 I have left. And now he writes a book called, It's Not What Happens to You, It's What You Do About It. You see, you can focus on what you've lost. You can focus on, you know, what you can't do, or you can focus on what you can do. And we as a body of Christ, we must focus on what the, the infinite potential of what God has for our lives. If all God gives you to do in this life is brush your teeth and just brush it for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That brings me to my final point. We need to, if we want to finish well, we must formulate a plan. We must formulate a plan. You know, there's so many things that God has for our future. But you're not going to get there if you just, you know, wait for it to happen. Things happen because you get a plan from God and you do something and you formulate a, a, a strategy to get from here to there. If you don't formulate plans, you know, the most exciting thing about this freedom for the future is that I got to see the actual plan that's been laid out for the, you guys are going to get to see it over the next number of months. It is a magnificent plan. And I looked at it and I said, that's going to work and that's going to be doable. And it was a magnificent plan laid out for us to follow as a church. And we're going to get this job done. I believe we're going to do it in less time than even they're planning to have it done. Amen? But there's a plan. I asked John and Lisa Bevere, who are friends of ours, and I said to John and Lisa, I said, you guys have got this worldwide ministry, you're traveling all the time. How in the world do you write books? I was, I, was, I was like just baffled. They keep turning out book after book after book, and they're like this thick. John's like, oh, 400 hours I did this, and you know, people just go there and clean out his, 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 his inventory because, you know, they're just so captivated by his content. And this is what John and Lisa told me. They said, we formulated a plan that we would not go into the office each day until we had written 1,000 words. So... Five days a week, they write a thousand words and then they go into the office. Now, a thousand words is not that much, but a thousand plus a thousand plus a thousand plus a thousand, after about two months, you've got a book. And it starts with, with setting a goal and formulating a plan to get it done. All right? It may not happen in, you know, in, in, if you say when, the, when I get this emotional rush that I'm just going to sit down and write a book, it's not going to happen unless you actually make a plan to make it happen. Amen? Amen. I was struggling with my Bible reading until I, I went and just got an online program. I use a thing called YouVersion. It has a fantastic, whole, they got about 150 plans that you can choose from to read from Genesis to Revelation every year. Just a handful of scriptures that come up on your screen. And if you miss a few, you hit a button that says, catch me up, and it puts you back on the right page. And, you know, but there's a, there's a strategic plan to read the Bible throughout the year. Because if you just pick up the Bible and you flip it and just put your hand down, you're not going to get it done, I guarantee you. You've got to create a structure and create some form, sort of plan to make it happen. Amen? Now, it can be also for some of the things that you, that you do wrong, you know, one of my friends who used to work for me, he, he was always critical of people. He was always, you know, just bad-mouthing and critical of people. He's a great believer. But God said, I'm going to give you a plan to help stop you doing this. And he's like, okay, God, what is it? The Lord said, every time that you have something negative to say about, some, about somebody, you have to add them to your prayer list. Now, when I spoke to him last, his prayer list was about 800 people long. But let me tell you, he was very cautious about what he said about anybody. I know a friend of ours that has a 
she's in a secular workplace and she created a swear box. She's like, okay, you can swear, but if you swear, you have to put a dollar into the swear box. I mean, she's given hundreds of dollars to world missions. <laughs> but it's like in the office, it's like people are like, uh, is that worth really worth putting a buck into there? And, and you know, it's become a part of the culture. It's actually a fun thing that people actually respond. And they created a system or structure to help to monitor people's words. Amen? Amen. These are just a few ideas. If you can do something for 28 days in a row, it'll become a habit and you can, and it will become a part of your life. So getting to do something for 28 days, whether it's losing weight or whatever it is, if you can do it for 28 days, it will become a habit, become a part of your life. I just was reading today about the Comrades Marathon. The Comrades Marathon in, in, in South Africa, and we're going to close off over here. The, it's a marathon that they run, it's 56 miles long. From the city I, I used to live in to Durban, which is on the East Coast, it's one of the longest marathons in the world, 56 miles. And the one year it goes uphill, and the next year it goes downhill. And the Comrades Marathon is a unique marathon because it's not about who wins the marathon. Everybody who finishes within 12 hours gets a medal. One year, 14,000 people finished it. So it's not about who wins it, it's who finishes it. And the idea in the Comrades Marathon is that you're not trying to compete with somebody, you're trying to partner and help somebody. So people who finish go back and, and then they come alongside other people who are running. And we as believers, we need to be all running towards a finish line and we're helping each other to get through and to cross. Amen? We need each other. And when you know that somebody's called, and just with my daughter, I keep having to speak to her and say, God spoke this way before you were born. God, had, she was dedicated by Reinhard Bonker that she'd be an Esther, that she would be used by God in high levels of government and, and in, in, in the areas that she's, she's preparing. And I keep speaking the prophetic word that God gave over her because so many times it becomes clouded. God's given almost everybody here promises, he's given you words, he's spoken things, but you know what, they don't, they're not automatically going to happen. You have to take a hold of them. You have to focus on them. You have to move towards them. You have to prepare your life, and you have to say, God, I'm going to take a hold of that which you took a hold of me for. And each of us have a calling. Each of us have a purpose. Each of us have something that God has. You can do nothing about the past, but from here, you're going to finish. Amen? The scripture I want to read comes from the Message Bible. I'm going to throw it up on the screen here. It's about this, this image of running. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs. One wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else about it, and then missing it out myself. Isn't that great words? No sloppy living. I'm focusing on the finish line. I'm going to get across. I'm going to finish this race well. I went and grew up in a boarding school in South Africa. And I was sent to boarding school when I was seven. 400 miles away from home. It was very difficult early years. Prepared me to be a missionary in the mission fields of Africa. And we used to have a sports day once a year. It was an athletics day that, that the, the school put on. And I remember that there was always one race. It was called the 880. It was four times round the track. And I remember that there was one guy in the school, because it happened every single year. And his name was Rodney McKenzie. We used to call him Fat Mac, because he was, he was quite overweight, and, and he was, you know, the slowest runner in the school. But he always entered the 880. And he started off, and he trundled. And by the time he got one time around the track, 
the guy who was winning had already lapped him. And then he went the second time round the track. And, and most of the field had lapped him. And by the third time round the track, when it came to the fourth time round the track, he was the only guy out there. They had already put the, the, wire, the wire across. The guy had finished the race. And, and, and everybody else in the race had finished. So there's only one guy left, and he's got one more lap to go. But you know what? Everybody has to watch him. He's the only guy out there. <laughs> and this happened every single year. And he would wait, and he would just trundle and trundle and get round, and when he came to that final lap, he would begin to pick up speed. And he would get about 200 yards from the finish line. And I mean, he began to move. You could feel the earth shake with this kid as he came around that final corner. His face was red. I mean, it was like, it was, and the entire crowd now was on their feet and applauding this guy. And I mean, he got 10 times more applause than the guy who won the race. <laughs> but I always have this image of, of Rodney McKenzie finishing well. It didn't make a difference that he was last and everybody else had done. The fact is that when he came around that thing, every ounce of his strength, every ounce of his being was in that final lap. And that just stood as a memory in my mind. God, I want to finish well. I want whatever I have between now and the time that you come or that you take me home. God, I want to focus on what you have for my life. I cannot do anything about the past. Don't let the enemy bring up anything. One thing you do, forget what's behind. Remember what he has promised and what he has for you. Set your focus on what God has ahead and run in a way that's going to finish well. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand. I have one last scripture that's going to come up on the screen. I, I read this and it just, I loved it. 2 Samuel 14, 14. This is what the lady who comes to convince David to bring back Absalom comes is, 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 is brought by Joab and David has to make a decision about Absalom. And this woman says to David... All of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, He devises ways to bring us back when we've been separated from Him. God formulates a plan to redeem everything in our lives. Whenever we've messed up, whenever we've done wrong, whenever we're away from Him, heaven is formulating a plan. God is devising ways to bring us back. Bring us back into our calling. Bring us back close to Him. Bring us back into fellowship with Him. God is so intent on helping every one of us to finish well. But I want to just challenge you tonight if you came in here and maybe you don't even know why you came or maybe a friend brought you but you're away from God tonight and you know tonight that God is stirring your heart to come back to Him stirring your heart maybe if you've never been in a relationship with God that tonight is your night that you need to make things right between you and heaven God loves you He sent Jesus to provide a method by which our sins could be forgiven that we could come back in relationship with the living God. And God is calling each one of us tonight to come back into the fold. I want to give everybody an opportunity tonight. If you need to have prayer, you need me to pray with you because tonight you've come in here and you know that God is wooing and calling you and calling you back into to, to a relationship with Him. And maybe you've never had a relationship with God and maybe you've messed up in your past. But Paul says, I'm going to put that all behind and I'm going to press to my future because God can redeem everything that you've done. And whatever you've had in your past, God can change it 
and make something new of your life. But you have to make a decision to serve Him. You've got to make a decision to give your heart and your life completely into the hands of Jesus. You may think that you're okay, but none, none of us by our own good, none of us by being good can ever make heaven. Each of us need the forgiveness of Jesus, and each of us need to be born again by His Spirit. Each of us need to completely give our heart and our lives into His hands. So I want to ask if there's anybody here tonight that you need prayer, and you need to give your life again to Jesus Christ. I'm going to count to three. And I want to give you an opportunity. And the reason we're going to count to three is that we all do this together. And if you need prayer and you need to come back to God, that we do this all together and that you, you know, you may say, well, I may be embarrassed if I do that. But you know what? If you will confess God before man, if you'll take a stand and say, Jesus, I want to be yours and I want to belong to you, and you'll take a stand for him. The Bible says one day before the angels of heaven Jesus will stand and say, that person was not ashamed of me and not ashamed to give their life to me, even no matter where they were. And I will now confess them before the Father. The Bible says, but if you won't do that and you won't take a stand for him, that one day Jesus will deny you before the Father. They said that person did not have the courage to take a stand. Jesus did everything he could. He died on a cross for every one of us. We have to make the decision to accept him. And so I'm going to give everybody a chance to do that. I'd like us all just to close your eyes in the presence of God. This is between you and God. I'm going to count to three. If you need prayer and you need to come back to God or you need to give your life to Him tonight, I'm going to ask you just to raise up your hand as I get to the number three. This is between you and God. One, two, Three, let me see your hand. Just raise it up. I see a hand there. 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 I see hands there. I see hands there. I see a hand here. Anybody else that you need to make that decision tonight? Raise up your hand so I can see it. I see a hand back there. I see a hands back there. There are hands all over. I'd like us all to stand in the presence of God. We're coming. We're at the very end of the service. I'd like those people that you want me to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I want you just to step in the aisle. Meet me down up front here, and we're going to sing a song. I want every one of you to come and meet, and let's, let's transact business with God tonight. Let's believe God to change your future here tonight. Let's sing a song if we could, and those of you just step out into the aisle and come and join me up front, and we can pray together, and let's transact some business before God. Let's give the Lord a hand. Please step out in the aisle. There were many hands. Come and join us up front here. God bless you. God bless you as you come. God bless you as you come. Make things right between you and God tonight. God bless you as you come. God bless you. God bless you as you come. In the very back there, please come down. I want to pray. God bless you as you come. God bless you as you come. Come and stand up front. God bless you. God bless you for having courage to come tonight. Make things right between you and God. God bless you. God bless you guys. Anybody else that needs to join them? God bless you. You guys have made the best decision you could ever make. Still a few people coming. God bless you. Please, you don't get many chances like this. But God's tugging at your heart. Come back home. Let's transact business together. If you're, if you're here and you didn't come, but we're going to pray right now, all of us together in agreement with those up front here, I want you just to pray this prayer to Jesus. Bow your heads before God. Just say, Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. I thank you that I have a future. I have a hope ahead of me. I forget those things that you're behind. But I ask you, Jesus, right now wash my past with your precious blood I believe you paid the price on the cross with your blood for my sins forgive the past I put it behind me and I ask you Jesus take control of my future come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior from this day forward 
I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand, amen. God bless you. I'd like, I'd like all of you guys to turn to my right and to your left. You can follow Pastor Joel. He's just going to do three quick things. He's going to pray with you. We've already prayed. He's going to give you some free literature. And he's also going to introduce the SBT program. The, the Rock has programs and has plans that can help you to grow in him. If you can just take a, a left turn, follow Pastor Joel, and just a few minutes, give them a hand as they go. Amen.